Amid the neon pants and the hair metal, critics gathered to celebrate yet another great year in cinema history. That's not a knife. That's a knife. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 movies from 1986. Sometimes, McLeod, the sharpest blade is not enough. For this list, we've rounded up the best films from all genres that came out in the year 1986. We're basing our choices on a mix of their popularity, quality, and influence, as well as their critical and audience reception. Look, you're a plant, an inanimate object. Does this look inanimate to you, punk? Number 10, Pretty in Pink. John Hughes' Brat Pack films took over the world in the early 80s and redefined the teen movie. So where are you guys banned? Oh, a friend of mine was having a party. Oh, how adorable! Yeah, it was a little intense. And in the process, Molly Ringwald became a teen idol, so this film was destined for success the moment it was conceived. I live it. It's just sometimes I get a little upset and I lose my temper. Ringwald plays Andy, a high school senior caught up in your usual high school drama. You can't do this and, and respect yourself. As Andy falls for the wealthy, preppy boy Blaine, her best friend Ducky falls for her, and her father falls on hard times. While through it all, she's got an upcoming prom to worry about. He backed out on me. He said he asked somebody else and he forgot about it. <laughs> With memorable performances, a pure 80s aesthetic, and a brilliant soundtrack, few films define an era so well. Yo, man, next time I kick your ass. That'll be that. That'll, I'm just kidding. That's it's a joke. <laughs> Number nine, Blue Velvet. Here's to an interesting experience, huh? I'll drink to that. After the critical failure of Dune, David Lynch realized he wasn't a big-budget Hollywood director, and he never would be. This is it. Thankfully, this decision spawned some of the greatest indie surrealist masterpieces of all time, including this classic of disturbing Americana. I don't know. I mean, it sounds like a good daydream, but actually doing it's too weird. Although not initially successful, this deconstruction of the American image became a cult phenomenon. When young Jeffrey discovers a severed ear in his quiet hometown and decides to play detective, all hell breaks loose. I uh, found an ear. You did? A human ear? Hiding behind the white picket fences are sadistic killers, sex crimes, and kidnappings. I think Frank kidnapped her husband and son. I have no hard proof of any of this. Relaunching the career of the great Dennis Hopper, Blue Velvet introduced the world to pure insanity and symbolism never before seen on the silver screen. Hey, you wanna go for a ride? No thanks. No thanks, what, what, what does that mean? Number eight, The Color of Money. So this is liquor money, huh? So, I invest. You know what I invest in? Excellence. A sequel to 1961's The Hustler, the Color of Money follows a much older Fast Eddie, played again by Paul Newman. Here is you, see? Here is Atlantic City. In between is about 27 pool halls. Three weeks, a couple thousand dollars. What the hell else do you need? An Indian guy? Use your brain! A pool hustler extraordinaire turned liquor salesman, Eddie had hung up his pool cue. Until he discovered a young Tom Cruise, who seemed to be an equally gifted player. Can draw some beat, huh? Deciding to take him under his wing, Eddie convinces Vincent and his girlfriend to go on the road with him so he can teach him the hustling ropes. Yeah, Vincent, if you're gonna take the plunge, give yourself a fair shake. There you go with this thing half-assed, nobody's gonna do any good. Although not Martin Scorsese's biggest critical success, the film was a hit with audiences and won Newman a long overdue Oscar. Now what the hell is it? Do I not speak your native language? What is the matter? Number seven. Top Gun. Uh, Thanks. Lieutenant. What were you doing there? <clears throat> Communicating. Communicating. Since we couldn't get enough Tom Cruise in 1986, here he is again in another blockbuster. I guess I fly by wasn't such a big hit, huh? 
Cruz plays Maverick, a rowdy and reckless lieutenant who gets a chance to train as a Navy fighter pilot, but is challenged by Val Kilmer's Iceman. Maverick, it's not your flying, it's your attitude. This often quoted and parodied story of feuding fighter pilots ended up becoming an 80s classic and the highest grossing film of the year, with the Library of Congress choosing it for the National Film Registry as a film that is culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. Woo! Rock and roll! There's our chance, it's a big one, Goose. One thing's for sure, they gave the world the need for speed. I feel the need, the need. Speed. Number 6. The Fly By the mid-80s, the world knew David Cronenberg pretty well, following a string of moderate successes in the sci-fi horror genre, but he exploded to megastardom with The Fly. You're disgusting, as always. His most accessible movie to date, the Fly brought gruesome body horror to the masses, as audiences marveled at Jeff Goldblum's slow transformation into a human fly. No, really, what is it? It's like hairs or something. Thanks to a teleportation experiment gone wrong, we experienced the painful consequences of Seth Brundle's scientific arrogance. No, an old lady who swallowed a fly, perhaps she'll die. This horror remake was a cut above the rest, in a decade that was saturated with below-grade gory sequels to never-ending slasher franchises. <laughs> Number 5. Hannah and Her Sisters oh, bravo. Book ended by Thanksgiving dinners, the narrative of the Oscar-winning Hannah and Her Sisters is pure Woody Allen. Wasn't there anything I can do? Push-ups or hormones? Over a two-year period, we are voyeurs in the intertwining lives of three sisters, Hannah, Lee, and Holly, and their experiences with their husbands, lovers, failed careers, drug addiction, affairs, alcoholism, and suicide attempts. I want you to take care of me, and I love when you do things to me. If you think this sounds like a cheesy soap opera melodrama, you don't know Woody. Let me ask you, in reincarnation, does that mean my soul would pass to another human being, or would I come back as a moose or an oddball or something? One of the biggest comedic successes in his over 40-year film career, and certainly his finest work of the decade, this film marked a turning point for Alan, echoing his fantastic dramatic work to come. There's maybe one or two things in there that I would do differently myself, but, right. but who cares? It was just... It was fabulous. Number four, Stand By Me. Suck my fat one, you cheap dime store hood. By 1986, Stephen King was already known as the king of horror. Bert, you were so scared you looked like that fat guy, Abigail Stowe, when he saw the mummy. So since it was released just a few weeks after his directorial disaster, Maximum Overdrive, most people did not know what to expect from Stand By Me. Based on his novella, The Body, this movie shocked the world with its innocent, heartwarming story and its serious lack of demon children and killer cars. For me, the idea of seeing that kid's dead body was starting to become an obsession. As we follow four boys on a journey to find a supposed dead body, they encounter gangs, leeches, and barreling trains, and become the greatest of friends with one of those unbreakable bonds. Give me some skin. Even Stephen King loved it, and he usually hates his adaptations. None of us could breathe. Somewhere under those bushes was the rest of Ray Brower. Number 3. Ferris Bueller's Day Off As we've already mentioned, teen movies were huge in the 80s, and they were successfully reinventing themselves. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Ferris Bueller's Day Off somehow stands apart from the pack. I'm so disappointed in Cameron. 20 bucks as he's sitting in his car debating about whether or not he should go out. Instead of focusing on teenage life and all the relationships, school trouble, proms, dates, and pimples that come with it, 
The film focuses on one particular character, the coolest kid you will ever meet. Nothing good. <laughs> nothing, no, nothing, this, what do you mean nothing good? Ferris is the guy you always wanted to be, and the friend you always wish you had. Whether the theory that Ferris is a figment of best friend Cameron's imagination is true or not, we still end up with a sophisticated, philosophizing, and influential culture bomb that fans will never stop quoting. Rooney, I don't have all day to bark at you, so I'm gonna make this short and sweet. Number two, Platoon. Police up your extra ammo and frags. Don't leave nothing for the dinks. Since Apocalypse Now staked its claim as the definitive war film in 1979, the 80s mostly ignored the genre. We did not fight the enemy, we fought ourselves. Then comes Platoon, the first in Oliver Stone's trilogy of Vietnam War films. Bob, I got a bad feeling on this one, all right? I mean, I got a bad feeling. I don't think I'm gonna make it out of here. You understand what I'm saying to you? Charlie Sheen stars as Private Taylor and gives the MTV generation a front row look at the horrors in Vietnam, a war still fresh in many people's minds. I figured why should just the poor kids go off to war and the rich kids always get away with it? The war flick was no longer your dad's genre, as Platoon starred one of the generation's biggest young stars in a devastating depiction of relentless warfare. Stagger yourself across this line. Shoot anything that moves. They'll be coming from over there. It also paved the way for the likes of Full Metal Jacket, Glory and Saving Private Ryan, and won Oliver Stone the highest honor at that year's Oscars. That's a nice way of putting it. Before we reveal our number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. Did you mind losing? Of course I do. I don't think you're such a splendid player, though. The light was behind you, and it was in my eyes. I never said I was. See? You think they'd let us walk in and out like the wind? Yes, I thought that was your whole damn point. What? What is it? It's a present. It ain't gonna hurt the little lady, is it? Oh, now why the concern? Well, <laughs> Welcome, sex pistols. Fools. You reckon number four will put up their last shot, Dad? Yeah, probably. They've been picking low all night. Yeah. Number one, aliens. Get away from her, you bitch! You wouldn't expect a sci-fi horror sequel to rank among the greatest movies of any year. I'd like to keep this handy for close encounters. When James Cameron is helming the project, though, the sky's the limit. Oh yeah, sure! With those things running around? You count me out. Influenced by the horrors of Vietnam, Cameron gave Aliens an action film twist and thrust Ellen Ripley back into combat with the vicious xenomorphs, this time with the aid of a bunch of space marines. All we know is that there's still no contact with the colony and that a xenomorph may be involved. Excuse me, sir, a, a what? A xenomorph. It's a bug hunt. Witty, thrilling, and the definition of a blockbuster. Aliens was nominated for seven Academy Awards and won two. To this day, it can still take an audience's breath away. Do you agree with our list? Yep. What's your favorite movie from 1986? For more entertaining top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. You just listen to the old pork chop express here now and take his advice on a dark and stormy night when the lightning's crashing and the thunder's rolling and the rain's coming down in sheets thick as lead.